Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember to support, please subscribe. The Dreadful Trial of Anne Boleyn. Now, in our last video, we looked at Anne Boleyn's last day of freedom and briefly looked into what her charges were. But today, Anne is to be tried for adultery and treason. And if she is found guilty, she will be sentenced to death. The question we find ourselves asking is, did Anne stand any chance of a fair hearing, or was her fate already sealed? On the 1st of May, 1536, at 9am, the trial began in the Great Hall. Now, the hall hosted the most infamous trial in Tudor, England, and Anne was the most famous woman in Tudor, Europe. Thomas Cromwell, the king's right-hand man, and the architect of the trial was present. Cromwell's relationship with Henry VIII was dwindling, so he decided that Anne must go. Anne had been arrested 13 days previous, but now she faced a trial and the judge and jury had been selected by Cromwell himself. Anne's uncle presided over the trial. Many would think that Cromwell would have seen this as a risk, but actually, the Duke of Norfolk said five years ago that Anne would be the ruin of his family. The jury was made up of 26 peers, one of which being Anne's own father. But that did not go in Anne's favour, for if they did not vote in favour of the king, then their heads would be on the line. For the trial, Anne was centre stage, and there were 2,000 members of the public there to witness the spectacle of the century. Henry, however, did not attend. He was in the Palace of Whitehall, but he did keep a close eye, for if Anne was found guilty, then a cannon would be fired from the Tower of London. You see, Henry had already had his eyes set on his new bride. Jane Seymour was ready and waiting, and rumours had spread of their relationship. Henry had given Jane a locket with his picture in it, and Anne was furious when she saw it. Henry did not waste any time, and Jane was waiting for him just one mile away in Chelsea. In the Tower of London, the court was assembled, and Anne was set to enter the scene, and silence was called. Gentlemen jailer of the Tower, bring in your prisoner, Norfolk announced. Anne is led into the courtroom by the jailer, and followed by her four ladies, those who were sent to spy on her by Cromwell. Spectators say that Anne never looked more in control and she held her head up high. The trial then began. Cromwell leads the prosecution, but the trial is not going as he had planned. The crowd did not expect Anne to hold herself with such dignity. And as Queen of England, she is allowed to sit. At this point, Anne is still unaware of what she is being charged with. There are surviving records of this trial, and they were kept in what is known as the Bag of Secrets. These records show something quite disturbing. You see, Anne was not given the chance to testify. They only show the side of the prosecution. The records also show that there was a severe undermining of the king, for Anne was being charged of adultery with four men, three sirs, Sir Henry Norris, Sir William Brereton and Sir Francis Weston, and a court musician, Mark Smeaton. But all four of these individuals were either close to the king or under his employ. And that was treason. These records also state that Anne was accused of 20 acts of adultery. The question I find myself asking and wondering is how must have Anne felt during this time? There must have been feelings of terror, disbelief and outrage. But Anne is noted to have remained calm and she was always 100% certain of her innocence. Eyewitnesses say that Anne seemed unmoved. But this made Cromwell become very agitated and he could see the atmosphere changing. The public who went into this trial believed that Anne was some monster, for she had betrayed the king, but she is holding herself up high. She is sure of her innocence, and she believes wholeheartedly that her God will save her, for she did no wrong, 
Anne was also an intellectual equal, and her education made her superior. The accusations of adultery is deeply serious, but it gets worse. She is accused of a sexual relationship with her brother, George, and the pair are accused of incest. The records state lots of secrets, and that she lured her brother, kissing with their tongues, in each other's mouths. Anne is accused of cardinal lust and witchery. Cromwell used a letter that she wrote to George when she told him that she was pregnant. In Cromwell's eyes, this letter must have meant that George was surely the father. Thomas Cromwell also said that George and Anne laughed at the king behind his back. But there was more evidence needed to support this claim. A star witness, if you like. And Jane Boleyn, Lady Rochford, George's own wife and Anne's sister-in-law, was this witness. It is clear that Jane wanted to bring George down and Anne with him. Anne was known as the Great Whore or the Concubine. But Anne had held herself with dignity and wisdom. Is it possible that the trial will go her way? The courtroom atmosphere was changing and the jury are impressed by her robust defence. A sad fact is that during the Tudor period, those of Highborn could not be tortured, but the lower class, such as Mark Smeaton, the court musician, could. Smeaton was interrogated for 24 hours, and he was the only one to crack, mostly because he had been tortured for the duration. He said that Anne singled him out for special attention, he admitted to making love to her on three occasions. But something that Mark Smeaton said that was hard to believe was that Margaret, one of Anne's ladies-in-waiting, hid him behind a curtain. In a particular room next to where Anne was, was a store, if you like, and in there, among many things, was marmalade. He said that Anne shouted to Margaret, "'Bring me a little marmalade.' to which Margaret obliged and said, here is the marmalade. And then she left for Mark Smeaton to stay behind. That way, it was inconspicuous. It is true that Anne did no doubtedly flirt, but she was trained in France of all places, in courtly love. But she was never alone, and an affair would have been hard to keep secret. Did she really lack the discipline to betray Henry? Usually, adultery would have seen that the woman was sent to a convent, but Henry wanted Anne gone. So Cromwell cooked up the most serious plan. Anne was to be done for high treason, plotting the death of the king. And Henry VIII, at this point in time, was very, very paranoid. He would have been easy to convince. Cromwell declared his discovery and claimed to have evidence from Henry Norris. Apparently, a couple of weeks previously, Anne had argued with Henry. She had asked him why he had not yet proposed to her cousin, and he replied that he would wait and see. Anne apparently took this, that he would wait to marry her instead. The constable of the tower then said that Anne declared the following... You look for dead men's shoes. You look good. You would look to have me. Cromwell had pulled a corker. Treason is the ultimate crime and punishable by death. Three days ago, there was another trial, and the outcome would greatly affect her situation. You see, the four adulterers had been put on trial in a way that would ensure the Queen's conviction for the four men must be found guilty, and only eyewitnesses actually survive of this trial. The men were in Westminster to face their trial, and the jury said that they had violated and had carnal knowledge of the said Queen at different times. No witness testified, and they were only allowed to say guilty or not guilty. Smeaton is the only one to confess. They were then to be publicly hung, drawn and quartered, with their privates to be cut off and burnt before them. And the outcome of this trial was to be kept quiet until after Anne's. They were then taken to the Tower of London to await their fate. No records of where, 
but the carvings in the walls of the Tower of London give clues. There is a falcon carved with the emblem of the Bolin family, a sure show of support, even though they faced imminent death. The conclusion of the trial is in, and Anne awaits her verdict. At two o'clock, Anne is about to learn her fate. She still thinks justice will prevail, for she is in fact innocent. Her faith and belief are total. The judge, Anne's uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, then sends the jury to deliberate. Moments later, with a unanimous decision, Anne is found guilty of treason. She is immediately stripped of her crown and her titles, and her sentence is then read by the Duke of Norfolk. Because thou hast offended our sovereign, the King's grace, in committing treason against his person, and her attained of the same, the law of the realm is this, that thou shall hath deserved death. And thou judgment is this, that thou shall be burned here within the Tower of London, or else to have thy head smitten off, as the king's pleasure shall be further known. The sentence is horrific, and both are Anne's worst nightmares. She must be frightened, but Anne was courageous. She remained unmoved, determined to show no fear or dismay. If she showed fear, it would give the men another victory. Surely Anne can challenge the verdict. And why was there no appeal? What was the reason for the unfairness? The answer to these questions is that everybody, and I mean everybody, felt too scared to not deliver the verdict that Henry VIII wanted. Anne then bravely stood up and said, I do not say that I have always borne towards the king the humility which I owed him, considering his kindness and the great honour he showed me, and the great respect he always paid me. I admit, too, that often I have taken it into my head to be jealous of him, but may God be my witness if I have done him any other wrong. Anne's response was so well thought through that you would think it was rehearsed. But how could it have been rehearsed if Anne, before now, did not know of her accusations? Her response was with no hesitation, and it was certainly straight from the heart. Cannons then fired from the Tower of London, and Henry was in his palace of Westminster when he heard the signal. The path is almost clear for he and Jane Seymour to marry. Anne is then escorted out of the trial, and the guards change their axes to face towards her, for she is now guilty and condemned. She is taken back to her apartments, and George, her brother, is then put on trial. His trial is swift. He is found guilty and taken back to prepare for death. Two days later, all five of the men are taken to Tower Hill for their executions. George is first because he is the highest ranking, and Mark Smeaton, the court musician, is last. All were beheaded and spared the painful death of being hung, drawn and quartered. And by the time Smeaton met the block, it and the scaffold would have been covered in the blood of the men that died before him. The sad matter is that Anne would have seen them leave, and then she saw their bodies being brought back. Anne had hoped and prayed for a miracle. But will the king give her a last-minute reprieve before her execution? Thank you for watching and to support. Please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.